the wall to understanding disease. How evolutionary biology explains why we get sick. Randolph Nessie, Arizona State University. On the 9th of November 1989, I was talking to other members of the new Evolution and Human Behavior program, finding ways to bridge that gap. We all will have a long-term shared memory. We will remember where we were on September 9, 2016. And whatever dark memories we have, I think we'll be forever joined with experiencing together a pinnacle of human creativity and intelligence and the warmest of international human hospitality. We're very thankful. My task is to talk about... So I've been interested since my early days in medical school with trying to understand not just why some people get sick, but why we all get sick. And the wall is still very large, I'm afraid. It's our task together, and perhaps some of you can help us to break it down. We're 157 years now after Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, and that wall is still high. Very few doctors learn about evolutionary biology. We have a gigantic opportunity to bring a whole new area of science to bear on disease. First two years of medical school, if you're not amazed by what you see, you are not paying attention. I mean, the heart is fabulous, of course, but it keeps pumping for 80, 90 years without ever taking a break and getting new seals. As for the eye, yes, it is as astounding as you think it is, although a blind spot in the middle of the back, what's that about? And then there's the hand, which is fabulous in itself, if you look at where all the tendons and arteries and bones go. Together, these things are so extraordinary, they're even better than the best Mercedes-Benz. They are fabulous. That's the first two years of medical school. Then you go into the clinic, and what do you see then? Botched designs. The first, cancer. Why can't we protect ourselves? Why aren't our bodies better protected against cancer? And then the back. It's not just you who has back pain. We all have back pain. And it was probably quite a lot worse about one and a half million years ago. Things have gotten better since then. As for cardiovascular disease, it's a new problem. It is not very common at all in people who live an ancestral lifestyle, but it has something to do with the fact that it's useful to have inflammatory cells lining your blood vessels so that you can deal with any bacteria or viruses that try to penetrate there. And it's only in modern circumstances they go haywire. Together, uh, there are other designs that really are not as good as a Mercedes. <laughs> not nearly. And then there's the obvious real problem why on earth did natural selection make it so the baby goes through that tiny ring of bone? Couldn't it just find another route? What do women really want, Freud said? What they really would like is a zipper so that we can get a different exit point. It would be so much simpler and safer. Here we have a mystery, a deep preoccupying mystery. Parts of the body are exquisite, at least as good as a Mercedes. Other parts of the body are terribly designed, and we want to know why is it that natural selection didn't make them all superb? Why didn't evolution make the body better? The answers provide a different kind of explanation of disease. The old, most medical research is a mechanic's view of how it works and what's broken and how to fix it. We are advocating taking an engineer's view of trying to understand why the body isn't better in the first place. You remember that plane that crashed, actually it didn't crash, thank goodness, as it was taking off, suddenly an engine blew up. Passengers had to be evacuated, a few were hurt, none died. So why did this happen? A mechanic's view found that this turbine shattered and flew out. In fact, it flew a thousand feet onto a building far away. That's the mechanic's question, the usual question, what is broken? That's a mechanic's question. But there's an engineer's question, and we also really want to know, all of us who fly on airplanes, why was it vulnerable to breaking in the first place? And the engineers have since discovered that the alloy in that particular batch of turbines was just slightly off in the mixture 
uh, different metals, making it brittle so it failed only about two-thirds of the way through its life cycle. This is a new question we want to ask about disease. So why should we care about this? It's not going to start a venture company immediately and make us all rich, but we're curious. It, intrinsically, this is interesting. And we can prevent medical mistakes. We can find new kinds of treatments thanks to research, not directly applying theory. But deeply, deeply, we, try have, we have a whole new kind of explanation we need to seek for disease. This got started in its current direction uh, 25 years ago with a paper George Williams and I wrote and a book of Deutsch. Hmm, warum wir krank werden. That's a, a graph of the number of articles that have appeared every year going up exponentially and even faster since this article was written. It's really taken off now with lots of books, two journals, and an international society, mainly thanks to the Wissenschaftskollegen zu Berlin an independent entity that most years for the past 15 years has invited a small group of scientists to Berlin to do whatever they think is most important for a year, especially a small group about evolution and medicine. This field would not exist except for people investing in things where no one can see the financial payoff yet. In the long run, we will all benefit, thanks to the Wissenschaftskollegen. Evolutionary medicine is simply the intersection of the basic science of evolutionary biology and the applied field of medicine. It's not trying to do anything for the species, it's trying to use that science to improve the human health of individuals. I'll give you quick examples of applications. These are some of them that we're going to go through. Cancer is one of the most dramatic. This is a picture of the young fellow who came to me as an undergraduate and said, I want to do a study. We studied the deans in all the medical schools in the country and discovered that they don't have any evolutionary biologists on the faculty, and even the rudiments of evolution are not taught. Now he has a special issue of Newsweek devoted to his work. One of his questions is, why don't elephants get more cancer than mice? They have more than a thousand times more cells. If cancer is just cells going rogue, they should get lots more cancer. Why don't they? And here's the answer, natural selection. Natural selection has created protective mechanisms so that elephants don't get that much cancer. And this led to a prediction he and others made that they might have extra copies of a gene called P53, which kills off cancer cells as they're starting to get bad. Indeed, they looked, and there are extra copies of P53 in elephants. Astounding. Here's an article by Maley and um, Mel Greaves in Nature, I think, showing that cancer evolves within the body. There are cells competing within a tumor, some reproducing faster than others. They're not all the same. They're competing, and unfortunately, the worst ones grow the fastest. So you would think, okay, if we're going to kill cancer, let's give a big dose of chemotherapy and kill as many as we can, because we've got to kill every one. That's a pre-evolutionary view. An ecological view of the tumor in its own ecosystem suggests that what we need to be doing instead is possibly in some circumstances using a lower dose of chemotherapy because some of those surrounding cells are inhibiting the growth of the more malignant ones. And in fact, Robert Gatenby um, has been doing studies, and there was a replication just published, so I'm more confident in this than I was recently, um, showing that the black line is no chemotherapy. The red line is regular chemotherapy. The green line, showing long-term survival of these mice, shows that they don't really die so long as you adjust the chemotherapy dose every week to how fast their cancer is growing. This is almost ready for human trials. It's revolutionary. I don't know if it'll work. And I emphasize no one should ever go directly from theory to treatment. Every time we come up with a new idea and we test it before we put it into the clinic, but boy, is this potentially powerful. Autoimmune diseases, you saw this graph before. Um, important, dramatic, declines in infectious disease, and epidemics of autoimmune disease. Most of our investment in medical research is looking at the mechanisms of the diseases, like asthma and Crohn's disease and multiple sclerosis. How about also looking at why they're increasing exponentially just in the last 50 years? Is it antibiotics? Is it lack of worms? What is it? Multiple sclerosis has dramatic data. Those cultures where many people have worms have very little progressive multiple sclerosis. Those with no worms in their guts have very high levels of multiple sclerosis. We talked about atherosclerosis a moment ago. It's a modern disease. What level of cholesterol is okay? 
Our doctors say, keep it under 200. But actually, if you look at people living in a more natural circumstance, levels are more like 120 to 130. How about aging, my original interest in this? Why doesn't natural selection just get rid of the genes that make some people age faster than others? Some researchers have been looking at what the genes are, but others are asking, what is the evolutionary explanation for why these genes stick around? The profound paper in 1957 by George Williams on the technical word is antagonistic pleiotropy, he pointed out that a gene that makes your bones heal faster in childhood is going to be selected for and become universal even if it also calcifies your coronary arteries and will kill you. Profound. If mortality didn't increase beyond age 20 in Germany today and just stayed the same, how many people would live to be 120, 200? No. The effect of aging is much greater than that. It's 30% of us would survive to age 1,000 if only the mortality rate stayed the same until for the whole rest of life. Carl Bergstrom is a mathematical biologist who took on an idea some doctors have been using. They were cycling antibiotics, using one for a few months in a hospital, then another one, then another one. He said, let's do the math and take this carefully. Turns out that what they were doing is not a bad way of creating multi-drug resistance. There are other ways of doing it that are better. How about the standard recommendation that doc many doctors give you, thinking that they're doing evolutionary things, about saying, take every pill in the bottle, you might not need it, but it might prevent antibiotic resistance. According to Andrew Reid, who also does mathematical modeling of this kind of thing, that actually is probably a good way of maximizing antibiotic resistance. And a recent article in JAMA showed that with people with community-acquired pneumonia, five days is just as good as 10 days if your fever is gone an easy way of decreasing antibiotic resistance. Alzheimer's disease, beta amyloid, has been thought of as the bad guy because it's found on neurons that are dying. Strong association. Everybody's thought about it as a toxic byproduct. Let's get rid of it. But the drugs that block beta amyloid synthesis don't work very well to cure, multiple, to, to cure dementia. Turns out that beta amyloid, just in the last few years, has been discovered itself to be a potent antimicrobial. It surrounds and entangles bacteria and fungi. How about a substance in milk, small oligosaccharides, that the baby can't digest? Another mystery. Why can't the baby digest them? It's because the bad bacteria also can't digest them, but good bifido, Good bacteria can, and the baby gives the new, the mother gives the new baby good bacteria and good things for those bacteria to eat, creating a normal microbiome right from the start. Lastly, panic disorder, something I've treated for many years. A mechanic's view is there's something wrong with the brain. Yes, there is in some people. But let's take an engineer's view. And from an engineer's view or a biologist's view, this is a fight flight response. And it's a false alarm and a false flight, flight response. So why so many when we're not really facing life-threatening danger? You're now in Africa. You're going to get water for your family. And you hear a small noise behind a rock. And that noise is, grr. It's not, grr. It's not, grr. It's just, grr. Should you run home? Or should you get water for your family? Well, it depends. You can do the math again. You need signal detection analysis to solve this problem. In particular, the cost of fleeing is 100 calories. The cost of not fleeing, if there is a lion behind that rock, is, oh, about 100,000 calories, which is what the lion would have to put on his Weight Watchers list if he ate you entirely. Look at the ratio. It's 1 to 1,000. This means that any time the noise is loud enough so that it means a lion is there with greater than the chance of one in 1,000, you should run. And that means that 999 times out of 1,000, that panic attack will not be necessary, but it'll still be perfectly normal. The implications for this for physicians doing other things in medicine are also profound, and I'd like to suggest that we can be doing personalized medicine with these principles if only we could teach doctors about evolutionary biology. This is a smoke detector principle. False alarms are normal and common. That is why we can safely block pain, anxiety, cough, and fever, except 
for the certain times when that defense is needed. And with this kind of thinking, doctors can start making individualized plans for their patients. We have now created an international society for evolution medicine and public health. Its third meeting will be in the Netherlands in August. You're all invited, and otherwise there are great web resources that our society has created. Thank you very much.